Hi, I'm Jeremiah Prophet, and today on Prophet's Resurrection Land Cruisers TV, a special episode about Land Cruisers and EMP resistance. Let's do it. So if you guys remember, a couple of years ago, we built a vehicle called the EMP-40. I'm actually wearing my EMP-40 garb today. Um, and we shot a really fun episode about it, kind of a fictitious episode. Uh, but, uh, you know, an EMP um, is a real thing. Uh, H-EMP specifically, high altitude uh, electromagnetic pulse, is something that I get a lot of calls about from clients asking, um, you know, is my Land Cruiser EMP resistant? Or uh, what do I need to do to it to make it EMP resistant? So, um, you know, whether or not you think that's a real threat um, is up to you, but it is fun to talk about and it's fun to look at these Land Cruisers. So let's go through some of them and we'll talk about what is HEMP resistant and what isn't. An EMP is an electromagnetic pulse caused by a sudden and abrupt burst of electromagnetic energy, either on the ground or in the atmosphere. That pulse causes a rapid acceleration of charged particles that can cause damage to electronic equipment. The real question is what equipment is vulnerable to an electromagnetic pulse? And the answer to that is no one really knows exactly. There has been some testing uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s specifically uh, in the US and other countries where we were detonating nuclear bombs both on the ground and in the atmosphere. Um, and in all cases, uh, there were symptoms uh, caused by not only the bomb, but the electromagnetic pulse itself. Probably the most noteworthy is one in 1962 uh, called Starfish. And Starfish was a 1.4 megaton nuclear bomb exploded about uh, 300 miles above the Earth's surface, 1,000 miles from Hawaii, and that pulse uh, damaged telephone communications and satellites and a lot of the equipment they were trying to use to monitor the explosion and kind of surprised everybody with how much damage it could actually do. So now a lot of countries obviously are thinking about using EMP as a weapon and you know that's a real thing. Now whether or not they're going to do it to where it affects you and I and our Land Cruisers, who knows. So it'd be nice to know if your Land Cruiser is EMP resistant. So let's talk about some of them. In fact, let's talk about this one. So it's common knowledge that older stuff is probably uh, safer during an HEMP or an EMP blast. Um, this is an older Land Cruiser, I think it's a 73, and this vehicle has no real electronic components to make the engine run. Um, it has a distributor with a points style ignition and uh, no computers anywhere. Uh, there's not an igniter on the, on the coil. And so those things are not electronic parts, meaning use um, devices to control the flow of electricity um, like solid state electronics and circuit boards and things like that. This is all old school mechanical electronics. So um, this vehicle right here uh, might very well be pretty uh, EMP resistant with that points type ignition. So let's go find a little bit newer FJ40 that might not be so EMP resistant and I'll show you why. And so this one, which is a 1983 FJ40, is a lot like every FJ60 in that it's got electronic ignition and it's got an igniter on the coil and those components are electronic, right? Inside of this are sensitive electronic devices that probably aren't going to survive that sudden rush of electronic particles, which causes a surge of electricity in the device um, and overcurrents the device, so floods it with electricity and can actually melt wires, blow fuses, circuit breakers, that kind of thing. So if you've got an igniter that looks like this on top of your coil, if you have the larger electronic distributor, um, then that system is more vulnerable than an older school points type ignition. So this is a 1983 Land Cruiser 2, but it's an HJ45. Now, for those of you who don't know, the first letter in every Land Cruiser designation means what engine type it is. H means six cylinder diesel, and so that's what this is. Uh, it's a 2H engine specifically. Even though it's the same year as my blue FJ40 that is not going to survive an EMP pulse if it's bad enough and close enough because it has an electronic ignition, this thing doesn't have anything electronic at all. Um, it did, it had an EDIC motor, 
Um, an EDIC motor is a thing that controls the fuel on an old Toyota diesel. I'll show you one when we get inside in a little bit. But it's basically a motor that controls um, the position of the fuel solenoid uh, so that if you can allow fuel to the engine or not. Um, that motor is pretty robust and probably would survive an EMP blast, although most of them are broken anyway, and everyone has switched over to controlling these with cable. So if you look right here, there's a makeshift cable on the injection pump. And this is going to pull this lever into a couple of different positions, start or run or off, and tell this engine whether or not it needs to have fuel. So the addition of this cable means that this engine is 100% mechanical. And other than the starter and the alternator, there's nothing electronic about it. So this engine would actually run. As a matter of fact, because this is a manual transmission, you could pull the cable into the run position, push start the vehicle without a battery in it at all, and drive it around like that. You don't even need anything electric at all, unless you wanted to jam some tunes. Uh, so um, old mechanical diesels like this, very durable. That would be all of the 2Hs, uh, 12HTs, most of them, 1HZs, and even the B series diesel. B means four cylinder diesel, by the way. Um, so let's go look at one of those. Oh, we didn't even have to go inside because there's one right here. So this is a BJ45 Troopy, and it's got a 3B diesel engine in it. That is cable control. Like that HJ45, this used to have an EDIC motor that controlled three positions on the injection pump, um, off, run, and start. Um, and that's been eliminated and a cable put in its place because like I said, those EDIC motors, they had a problem and they didn't last anyway. So this baby right here wouldn't require any electricity at all to run. I'll show you. So it's actually this cable right here that controls the fuel and whether or not this vehicle is running or not running. Uh, rotation of the engine X'd out when you push that in, running when you pull it out. By the way, I should mention that this BJ45 is for sale on our website right now on consignment and it's a pretty sweet rig. So here's a 12HT, a little bit newer Toyota diesel. Um, still mechanical, right? Nothing electronic about this. Um, some of the newer Toyota diesels did have some electronic features, but the injection pump is still mechanical. This one has an electric fuel solenoid, uh, but pretty robust electronic device that probably would survive an EMP pulse. Um, but what about the batteries? What about the starter motor? What about the alternator? So conventional wisdom and just you don't have to trust me on any of this. I probably don't know as much as lots and lots of people, but I think conventional wisdom is that an EMP blast wouldn't affect batteries um, or large devices like alternators and starters that aren't computer controlled. Uh, but just for fun, would this car run if you took the batteries out of it, uh, like the HJ45 we were just looking at? Uh, no, it wouldn't, because this is an automatic, and so you wouldn't have any way to get it going. You can push start something with a manual transmission, um, an automatic, you pretty much have to have a starter motor to crank it over. Once you had it running, you still couldn't take the batteries out because this does require a little bit of electricity to keep that fuel solenoid open, unlike the earlier ones with the EDIC motor where you could just manually move the lever. So we talked about Toyota diesels up through 88 or 89. What about engine conversions, especially diesel engine conversions? Well, here's a Cummins R2.8. Uh, would this be EMP resistant? Not so much. Um, this is heavily computer reliant to run. Uh, there's an ECM that runs the engine, uh, also one for the transmission in this case because it's an eight-speed automatic. Uh, lots of sensitive electronics in here that, uh, you know, in the event of uh, an HEMP blast that was big enough and strong enough and close enough, probably make this vehicle ineffective. But we do have a couple of diesel engine conversion vehicles here that would run, so let's go look at those. And here's another Land Cruiser that's here for sale, and it's got a diesel that would be EMP resistant, a 12 valve Cummins. Let's check it out. So the 12 valve Cummins, which barely fits in a Land Cruiser, but does actually fit, um, is from an early 90s Dodge, and nothing electronic about this engine either. Although on a Dodge, that changed just a little bit later with the 24 valve when it became electronically controlled. This engine, just like a 12HT Toyota diesel, is gonna have that electric fuel cut solenoid, so you have to have electricity to make it run, but really no electronic components to make it run. So another thing that I need to mention is a Faraday cage. Uh, guys have asked me, well, what about keeping my vehicle in a Faraday cage or a Faraday box? So a Faraday cage is nothing more than a steel uh, or metal enclosure. It doesn't even have to be steel. Um, 
So the electricity uh, doesn't travel on the inside of a wire, it travels on the outside of a wire. And similarly, uh, the electromagnetic field from an EMP pulse would travel on the outside of any sealed steel box. So um, you could take your vehicle and put it in a, a Faraday structure or maybe even a Connex box. And as long as the box was sealed tightly enough, uh, the holes were small enough, um, any penetrations were insulated correctly and there was the right kind of gasket around the door, then that could protect your devices. And for that matter, uh, you could make a small Faraday cage, maybe out of a trash can and seal it up. And if you had backups for all the electronics on your vehicle, like a backup igniter and a backup distributor, um, anything electronic that it needed, seal in a Faraday cage. If there was a big enough uh, EMP pulse that took out the stuff in your car, you'd have spares. So let's go look at a Connex box and see how that might work for one. So I mean, I'm certainly no expert on any of this. As a matter of fact, um, you know, other than just talking about it, I've only read a couple of books. I'm sure that a lot of people um, out there are better sources than me, but um, I did read that a Connex box like this could be a good Faraday cage as long as a couple of provisions were made. Um, you know, there's vents in these, uh, holes uh, for air to get in and out. Um, those have to be structured in a, in a honeycomb fashion. This one doesn't look like they are. I know some of these boxes are, are made to be uh, EMP resistant. I don't think these are. That would have to be changed. And then also um, this rubber gasket right here, even if these doors were closed, these are a really good seal. Uh, but these rubber gaskets right here would let um, an EMP pulse travel into the box. And so they, they actually make gaskets uh, like a copper weave gasket uh, for these. But you know that, that's the other option. If your vehicle's not um, EMP resistant, you might be able to make structure for it. That is. So I told you we had two engine conversions here, diesel engine conversions here that were EMP resistant. Here's the other one, and you guys will recognize this is the old school Cummins 4BT. Um, this engine has existed since the 70s, uh, but they're still, I don't know when they stopped making them, probably mid 80s, but you can still get them remanufactured today and they're all mechanical. Uh, there is an electric fuel cut solenoid, but this baby right here is about as robust as they come. And this vehicle right here is one we're gonna feature pretty soon. As a matter of fact, this is going to exhaust today. By the end of next week, it's gonna be just about done and it's getting ready to go restart its tour of duty with its owner in Montana in a very short period of time. So look forward to a feature of this coming in the next episode. So that leads us back to this diesel. So this is a KZJ73. Uh, non-US Land Cruiser 70 series, obviously, with a little bit different engine in it, uh, a, K, a K series diesel, uh, that's also pretty much EMP resistant because it doesn't rely on a computer for the engine to run. So I know there's a computer in here that controls the start cycle to give it a little bit more fuel when you're starting, but it's likely that it would start if that computer failed. Um, so this thing, electronically wise, would probably be okay, at least on the running side of the engine. Uh, K series diesels are something that we don't get here very often. In fact, this is one of the very first ones that we've done a lot of work to, uh, and this is a cool truck. So while we're talking about this, let's look at what we did to this vehicle. This Land Cruiser came to us from Mexico, and we didn't restore really any of the exterior. We just added a bunch of really cool custom features and changed the interior. Up front, we stuck with a factory bumper for this model, but we modified it for a winch, and we installed a heavy-duty winch cradle behind it for a worn 10,000-pound winch. And we also integrated some cool Baja Designs lights up front and installed rigid truck lights to enhance nighttime drivability. We also installed a Cascadia solar panel on the hood, and I actually really like the way this turned out. I wish that Cascadia would have made it so that the charge cable came right out of the bottom of the solar panel so the cable didn't have to go back across the hood, but I have too many dead batteries so I should have one of these on every vehicle I own. In addition to the accessories in the front, we added an Ezeon K9 roof rack and some other cool doodads in the back. This Land Cruiser came to us already with a dual swing out bumper in the rear, uh, but there was nothing on the driver's side for a cooler, so we added a custom cooler basket uh, for the cooler of choice. And then also behind the spare tire, we added a unique feature, and that would be an ARB dual compressor with also dual apex hose reels for easy access to all four tires. In the back of the Land Cruiser, we added the controls for the ARB compressor and a goose gear drawer system along with an inverter. The interior of this Land Cruiser is where we spent the majority of our time changing the color from gray to tan, just like we did that FJ62 that we shot at the Gunnison Car Show last summer. 
Uh, somehow tan interiors are super popular now and um, even though it's a lot of work to get it done nicely, this interior turned out just beautifully. By the way, this might be the most comfortable leather I have ever sat on and I am going to be using this in future projects. In addition to the color change in the new leather, we added our Tuffy box with a wireless charging and also a retro stereo with amp and subwoofer. Check this out. So, FJ55, this is something we're gonna have for, uh, pretty soon on our online store. FJ55s, uh, nobody does anything for these, right? And, and we don't get to work on them very often, but um, these are new door panels and they are uh, sewn in the factory configuration. We're not gonna offer door uh, panels complete, but we are gonna offer these. So these are water jet cut um, door panel cards uh, for the entire 55 uh, that we're gonna have on our website pretty soon. Just the cards, right? So you can cover it yourself. Those turned out really, really good. And a couple of other things, actually, since we're talking about 55s, we're offering something for the front lights I'll show you. Okay, so um, I love giving love to the pig. So uh, this is an FJ40 front marker light turn signal assembly, which you can get still brand new from Toyota. This part right here is angled to accommodate the front of an FJ40, the fender on an FJ40. That's the same light for an FJ55. Um, but that piece is different. So we've got this handy dandy 3D printed piece that we've made to replace the one that comes with the light so that you can mount these new turn signals by a set from Toyota, which are available for like less than 40 bucks. And now it's the right angle for your 55. How cool is that? On our online store now in the 3D printed parts section. So since we're here by the 55, there's nobody here working on it, but this, this is a really cool project. We took this uh, previously restored by somebody somewhere, 55, and retrofit a 3FE, five speed, um, new T case, disc brake front, all the cool stuff to make this highly drivable, uh, very cool FJ55 and uh, not EMP resistant because of the computer, but uh, still my favorite Toyota engine right there. So while we're talking about it, we've got this HDJ81 with a 1HDT Toyota diesel in it, and we're talking about EMP resistance. Eddie, do you think if there was an EMP blast or maybe a big solar flare and uh, electronics were fried, do you think this would still run? Yes, I do. Why do you think? Because the only, well, it's got a solenoid that holds the valve open to run. And that's it. That's it. But this one's clean. This one doesn't smoke like others. That's true. Which. <laughs> So you like this one? I like this one. Oh, what? <laughs> Put that on, I'm glad we got that on camera because Eddie doesn't like any diesels. As a matter of fact, when we were talking about that one, he was worried about migrating flocks of geese dropping dead when we start that for the first time because <laughs> of the smoke that's gonna go up in the atmosphere. So now we're coming back to this because there is actually somebody working on it right now. What's up, what's up, what are you doing? Oh, not much, I came over to put the hood on, we just got painted the underside and I got distracted by the rest of the parts on the shelf that are still waiting to be put on so it's you know. so close it's yeah, like it's super close there's a lot of little little detail things so we're getting we're yeah getting I see when, when the tackle boxes still have that much stuff in them that means yeah. there's a handful of things left to bolt on yeah I think a lot of stuff got processed that probably didn't really need to be or that never or whatever. happens <laughs> never, never happens but it's good for next time for the next next project well, yeah the next F, the next FJ55 seat mount so yeah. we're putting in yeah so yeah, I forgot that we did, in addition to this 3FE, an engine compartment restoration, right? Because it was ugly and rusty and you know had never been done. Lots of battery acid spilled in there over the years of brake fluid. Now, so we, did, we didn't paint the exterior, we just, the inside. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's pretty on the inside and underneath. Did the suspension and everything too, so. Like all pigs, yeah. pretty on the inside. Because <laughs> they sure ain't on the outside. <laughs> And I never used the word ain't, but that was, that was worth it. It that is worth talking about pigs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's you definitely throw that, the vocabulary. Throw an ain't in there every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Casey. Uh huh. With the, is that I like that add? light. That's awesome. This, that's exactly what I need next. Yeah, Todd, you stay right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't move with that the, light now. With the oh, surgical man, precision right. of, of, a, of a, I don't know, some kind of surgeon. What's the most, what do you have to, who's the, what's the best kind of surgeon? Brain surgeon? Heart surgeon? Brain surgeon, I'd say brain surgeon. Sean, who did your brain surgery? Does it 
like with the precision been? of with the precision of Sean's brain surgeon, Connor installs the carpet. So carpeting is horrible to do, right, Connor? I mean, like it it's, is because one slip up, like somebody just grabbing the carpet, and just like jerking it like that while you're working, <laughs> could could cause you to have to buy a whole new twelve hundred dollar kit. Yep. And it just takes patience, right? Nobody likes to do this, but Connor, he's. Oof. I don't Quite know if he likes right it. now. <laughs> or at least you have good light. Yeah, that, that, is, that is helpful. So you you know we're trying to advertise for a full-time upholstery person, Connor, to do this for you. Uh huh. We've been yes, advertising please. for over a year. Um, I'll buy all the equipment, um, you know, and set up a place, and we we haven't had a single applicant. You know why? Because upholstery is hard. Yeah. Not for you. We have good upholstery shops. The problem is they're all so far away. Grand Junction, Salt Lake City, Denver, Boise, Idaho. Perfect. You're getting there. Yeah. So you have to cut the sides. Yep. Around every bolt, around every fastener. You can't really drill this because if you do, the drill bits catch the fibers and just run it, like ruin it. Yeah. So it hot. Pulls melt. a strand all the way out. Yep. Yeah. Soldering iron through carpet. I see somebody peeking in. <laughs> Is that what you're using, a soldering, a soldering iron? Yeah. That's a good one. I've taken in the past and heated up, the, you know those punches you use to gasket punches? Yeah. You can heat those up and burn them through. And they're good for tattoos. Adley, what on earth are you doing? I am fixing a tunnel cover. This was two tunnel covers that were put together to make room for the engine coming into this guy and welds are not so pretty, so we're gonna try and make them look a little prettier. Welds aren't pretty? Well, they're not too bad, but so, no one yeah. wants to see the welds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, you even did the inside? I That's did the through. inside. Okay, so I was gonna, way to go, I was gonna show, oh, you can kind of still see a little evidence right here. So this, these tunnel covers are too short for a five speed, right? So it would have to, the five speed would rub right there. So we actually take and add a strip all the way around this and elevate this about an inch up to make room for it. And then we need to do body work on both the top and the bottom. And at least in charge of that. You know you're doing a good job when you have body filler, the proper mount on the underside of your tranny cover. Good job, man. Body filler everywhere. Well, well not everywhere. So Where do you need it? <laughs> body filler has a, has a bad reputation because people think that body filler is bad. And you'll see like, you know, people say, no, there's no body filler anywhere on this car. And that's never true. There's always body filler. There's body filler on brand new cars, lots of them. In the right amount, it's not bad. It's when you get it too thick and you get- Cars the, that are made out of, it's a whole yeah. different when story. You, when you do it outside corners, right? Like, you know, if, if this corner was built out of body filler, um, then it's more vulnerable to chips and scuffs. So any anytime you're doing body lines like that, if you have body filler on an outside corner, it's bad. But the right amount of body filler in the right place is a good spot. Gotta make it pretty, silky yeah. smooth. Yeah, silky smooth. Silky smooth. So this LV, what else did you do? Oh, did a little work on the firewall. We had a little bit of fab stuff to just cut some holes in it, and so I had to go through and feather that back into the old paint, and then 400 grit the whole thing. It's all gonna get reprimed and repainted, and then on the inside as well. Modernizing. This is getting that same engine, the 3 FE, that the pig got uh, and an engine compartment, you know, refresh to match. We had to change the firewall for a booster. Uh, we shortened, or we, you know, Shorten this brace so there's room for a booster. Move the booster over. Modifications for power steering. Modifications for the wires are gonna go through for the 3FE. AC stuff on the inside. One lucky FJ45 LV. Could be neat. My YouTube debut. That's right, his turn to have the gerbil. <laughs> so if you guys haven't noticed, everybody today has a little mic on them and it's, we're calling it the gerbil. So, <laughs> is the mic new? Yeah, it's yeah, the new mic, new camera, new Aaron. It's not, it's, so there's all this new stuff. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Aaron, We're well, and welcome. You've been here uh, almost two months, how long? 
Has it been two months? I don't think. Maybe about six weeks. Yeah. But yeah, um, I was actually a mechanic before I started here, and I've always been fascinated with the body side of things. And I'm here uh, under Bob's wing, and he's he's been a great mentor and teaching me the the way of way of the FJs and how to make them nice and cherry. So I'm cool. learning kind of a whole new skill set here from what I'm used to. Holy cow! And he's good on camera. We might have to put him on camera more often. Oh gosh. <laughs> that was like the second most articulate thing anybody's ever said on camera here. And, and <laughs> keeping in mind that we just came from Sean. So he's got, Aaron's got uh, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff in his background. One of them was working with wolves, yeah. training wolves. Yeah, well, I didn't train them. <laughs> I don't think wolves are very trainable, but we just worked, I worked at a wolf sanctuary for a couple of years and uh, we just lived off grid in the mountains and gave the wolves a home that were um, from captive situations of some sort or another, couldn't go back to the wild and we uh, gave them a home and I helped. I was actually their mechanic as long as, as, as well as working with the wolves, I kept all the old rigs of the sanctuary running and um, kept things running smooth around there. But I learned how to hang out with the wolves in the meantime and while I was there. Did you have to, did you have to, did they teach you how to howl? They did. You throw out a wolf out for us. <laughs> nice. That, nice. That, that I terrible. like it. I like it. <laughs> Adley, howl for us. <laughs> That's like that a was better. <laughs> that is good. All right. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Prophets Resurrection Land Cruisers TV. If you've got any questions or requests for things that we could talk about here on this show, just let us know. And. To round it out, why don't you guys watch, if you've got time, the end of episode 48, where the shop is hit by a fictitious EMP blast and we are rescued by the EMP-40. Thanks for watching. I'm just giving you crap about your clothes. Look at your shoe! Hey, I got new ones coming, man. I. That happened. Then oh, yeah. Sean stole my steel toe out of that one too. He took it and then he put it in the vice and squished it. So no, no, a steel toe on that side. I got one on that side, so that's nice. He took the steel toe out yeah. of your shoe. Yeah, it fell out. For then what? Then he, I don't know. What? Ask Sean. But yeah, this one's been falling apart for a little while. But People, our, our viewers are gonna think that like you get paid like six bucks an hour. <laughs> Look at your clothes. Look, hey, look, look at what I do all the time. I, I, I grind, and then hey, look, Alex does the exact same. Well, what if we not quite as bad? Hey, mine are nice. Look at that. Yeah, I don't have fireproof because that's expensive, and but you do have, you have the exact same holes. I just worn this one for like six months, and it turns into this. You look like a homeless person. You you, know, you burn through the pocket first, so you have the remnants of the pocket, right? And you rip off the pocket and get this hole, right? Oh, there was a, the whole pocket. Yeah, the whole. Well, I burned the. I set the whole pocket on fire. Uh, you just but then off one layer and move on to the next. Yeah, you gotta you gotta use them up yeah. all the way. Yeah, see, it's like the sleeves. You get the sleeves. This one burned. Looks like I shop at Hot Topic.